We have just a couple of announcements today. Uh, the first would be that, again, the connection card, we invite you to fill that out. And on the back, you'll see a couple things that you can sign up for. The first would be the leaders meeting on August 28th. That is for anybody who is involved in any ministry of serving at Zion. We'd love for you to come, and we get huddled together with groups. We learn a few things, we do some worship, and we eat. So sign up, and make sure you mention how many kids you would have coming that need some child care. Um, also, a new members class is starting September 11. So if you're interested in learning more about Zion, uh, you can go to that class and uh, hang out with Pastor Greg. He usually finds some treats to feed you, so that's a definite plus. You want some bagels or something like that, you got to go. All right. Um, also, Thelma van der Zouwen fell and broke her arm on Monday and is currently recovering at Brookcrest. Uh, at this time, I'd like to invite the middle school youth group, the whole group, to come up front, and those of you who are answering questions to stand in the front row. So if you're unaware, uh, we just Sunday through Friday were in Holland on a mission trip, and uh, it's good to see that you guys are not sleeping right now. Uh, everybody came back really tired. We were up to like 1.30 the last night, and so uh, it's good to see them energized again. All right, CC, what were some of the types of mission projects that we worked on? <laughs> Um, we had a lot of different jobs throughout the week. Uh, for most of the part, we played with the Blacktop Rec kids. And um, we had, but we worked on like other jobs as well. For example, every morning, um, there's this guy named Norm that worked at the church. And he gave us little like chores every day. Um, one of them was fixing up a house that uh, the church, like the people at the church rent out. Um, another one was painting uh the shed doors, organizing downstairs, um, and <laughs> uh, we painted a fence also. Uh, and then one day we went to the kids' food basket where uh, we got to help like cut cucumbers and package and color on bags. And then half of us did that, and then the other half of us went and helped um, with the blacktop rec, blacktop rec kids. Um, Practice 5K. Kendall, what were some of your favorite parts of the trip? Um, some of my favorite parts of the trip was just getting to know the kids at Blacktop and playing with them for like four hours each day. And then also I got to, we got to bond a lot as a youth group and we went to the beach and we, did, we played Newcomb and we just got to be with each other a lot. Kasia, same question. What were some of your favorite parts? Um, I think one of my favorite parts was just getting to know kids and listening to their stories. And, yeah. And Max. One of my favorite parts of the trip was probably before we went to BAM, uh, all of the kids were really excited. And I was in a group with someone who was just running around our group having a lot of fun. Cool. Thanks. Emily, how did you see God at work? Um, I saw God in a lot of different places. Uh, one of them was just in you guys. Um, parents, you did a really nice job with these kids. They are amazing people. Um, they love God, and they love sharing the gospel through their actions, um, just in how they treated each other um, and how they uh, just spent the whole week loving on kids and using that as a way to show Christ was um, one very distinctive way I saw God. And Alex, uh, what did you learn about yourself or someone else? Um, well, someone about someone else. Um, we could go on and on about what we learned about Cece. <laughs> but um, there was this one girl that I met at Blacktop Rack. Her name was Annika. And I got to learn a ton about her. She's, we just had some lots of small talk conversations. We ended up becoming great friends. Um, for example, like, she's going to Cambodia for Christmas. Her favorite color is red. Her favorite favorite pop is Mountain Dew. We just became friends. I know more about her than I do with most of these people, but <laughs> <laughs> we just had a great time. Thanks, guys. Um, yeah, there was 
amazing group bonding that happened with this, this group. They, they connected in ways uh, that I'd never seen a middle school group connect before. And yeah, as Alex mentioned, uh, Cece really came out of her shell on the trip. So uh, that was a lot of fun. So uh, let's give a hand to these guys for sharing about their trip. I guess there's just something about me that causes microphones to go crazy. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, we're going to show a video of the middle school mission trip. And as I've mentioned previous years, whenever you see uh, some text that's in quotes, it was written by someone from the group who was on the trip on Thursday nights. We always process everything by journaling for, I think they journal for like 45 minutes. Um, and so I, I take some of those quotes and throw them in the video just to help you to get a little bit of a glimpse uh, more of what happened on the trip. So here's the video.
Now I'd like to invite the high school group up with those who are answering questions to stand in front. Hopefully they remember everything from their experience. It was, you know, three weeks ago, I think, that we went on our trip uh, to Nashville. So, uh, Mason, where are you? Hey, what type of mission projects did you work on? All right, so our group, every single day, we went to an anchor site all five days. It was a YMCA that worked with middle school age kids, and uh, there we basically played games with them, basketball, kickball, we hung out, played air hockey, and it was a pretty cool organization. They uh, worked with like bettering the kids' futures. They had a luncheon, and they kind of talked about how to act like for a job interview. So we kind of monitored that, saw it, it was pretty cool. And uh, other things we did, we went to an organization called Nashville Cares that works with HIV slash AIDS people in the community. and. Uh, we helped with them. Uh, our group went to somebody's site, their house, and uh, we cleaned up weeds, we mowed, we took out boxes from years of them not doing anything. Uh, then another group we went to is called Salome. It was a medical type doctor's office and that worked with mainly refugees and immigrants who couldn't afford to go to or couldn't afford health care. So we walked around there and prayed over the different things, and they just loved to have people in there praying. They said it feels more calm there when there are people walking around praying over the building. And uh, also, we went to, uh, we had an immersion night, and uh, we had to eat lunch with a homeless person, ask them questions, a lot of other stuff like that. We had to find people in the city to ask about questions about the city. And then another night, Another day, we handed out water to people in the city, like homeless, because water in the city is kind of hard to get sometimes. So we decided to help them in the hot weather and hand them water. Thanks. And from the other group, Kaylee, what did your group work on? Um, every day, we went to this organization called NICE, and we um, basically like tutored these uh, refugee kids from all over the world. We like had different stations where we'd either teach them to read or like do math with them. And then um, in the mornings we'd go to different like organizations and either um, like separate uh, medical supplies that they sent across the country. And then um, we went to another place like a food bank and we um, separated a lot of food that I think they said fed like 5,000 people so that was good. That's all. You can hand it to Jack. Jack, what were some of your favorite parts of this trip? All right, so my favorite part, um, favorite parts about the mission trip was just getting to learn like a new culture in Nashville and uh, growing closer with the group. Uh, learning a lot of new things about people uh, on the immersion night, talking to strangers, talking to different people, learning about the city of Nashville, and uh, just growing closer to the group. And God, that was my favorite part. All right. Carly, same question. What were some of your favorite parts of the trip? Um, I liked the YMCA, like YCAP thing. I like talking to all the different kids and learning about them each. Thanks. Um, back to Kaylee. What was the hardest part of this trip? Um, the hardest part for me was probably uh, just that it was my first mission trip, so I was kind of going in blind, like I didn't know what to expect, but it was <laughs> still good. Once I like got into the zone and like kind of put myself out there. Good, Kenzie. Kenzie, where did you see God at work? I saw God at work, um, especially in our group, just wanting to work as hard as we could and get as much done as we could in the time we had, or in our worship sessions, we all got really into them. And with our CSM staff leaders, host, as they like guided us around the city all week, they were really inspirational and helped us to have positive attitude all week. All right. Yeah, you can hand it to Sarah. But um, what Kenzie said is, is so true. Our group likes to work hard, 
every mission trip we go on, uh, somebody along the week somewhere says, I've never seen a group accomplish so much so quickly. And we had that this past week too, or this past mission trip. So that was really cool. Good job, guys. Sarah, um, what have you learned about yourself or someone else? Um, we did this activity, and it was called Urban Exposure. And in that, we um, met this guy named David. And um, it was really cool just hearing, like, his story and what he had to say. And, um, like, and when he, um, he got in a car accident and um, he lost his job, and that enabled him to work. And it was really cool. And it, it just taught me that um, that could happen to anybody, and it just really made me appreciate what I had. So, yeah, he said something about he got in a car accident. His family passed away from that. His dad was in Nashville and was sick, right? So he went over there to take care of him because he lived in Detroit. Yeah, okay. And, uh, and then all the medical bills from that and losing his job left him in the streets. So our kids were very much like, wow, this could happen to any of us, that situation, you know? So that really hits home that, that uh, the homeless aren't just all lazy or mentally ill people. They're, these people have a story, and that's what our group learned as we interact with people. So let's give a hand to this group for sharing. You guys can have a seat. Before we show the high school video, we're going to take the offering during that time. Um, God has given us so much. And we realize that, especially on mission trips, that God has given us so much. And so an offering is a chance to give back to God through tithes and offerings. So as the deacons come forward to receive today's offering, uh, we ask that you sign those connection cards and put them in the collection plate that gets passed. Um, and again, the, the video that's going to be shown during the offering the quotes are things that were written in our group journal. You can please come forward.
I wasn't the one who wrote that last quote, but I am so thankful for the support that Zion gives, especially to the shareholders. Uh, the support that they give through prayer and finances is awesome. And uh, many of them had this new thing that happened. It kind of just, uh, it was something that I, I decided, hey, I'm going to give this out. Um, our students wrote devotionals for both of the mission trips to prepare us for the mission trip. And so they all wrote their own devotional, and then we prayed for that person each day. But from many of the shareholders, I gave them the, the devotionals as well to do along with us. And they, they all said, wow, these are so good. Uh, the whole church needs to be able to read these. And I said, that's great, but uh, I want to have special privileges for shareholders. So watch for that next year if you want to be a shareholder. Uh, you get to read the students' devotionals. <laughs> and the youth leaders are like, nice plug. Uh, <laughs> so um, definitely sign up next year. It's really fun to be a shareholder. You get to hear a whole different perspective of what's going on with the students. Uh, for today's message, the scripture comes from Luke 9, uh, verses 10 through 17. The story of when Jesus feeds the 5,000. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowd away so that they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging, because we are in a remote place here. And he replied, You give them something to eat. They answered, We only have five loaves of bread and two fish, unless we go and buy food for all this crowd. About 5,000 men were there. But he said to his disciples, have them sit in groups of 50, about 50 each. And the disciples did so. And everyone sat down, taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Let's pray together. God, we love your word. It's full of eternal truth that speaks to us even today. So may your word come alive to us today. May you speak into this community, into this people. Encourage where we need encouragement convict where we need change, and empower us to live as Christ in this place. Amen. Now this story where Jesus feeds the 5,000 is such a familiar story to most of us who grew up in the church. And we tell it to children right away. Uh, They probably hear it over and over. And we tell it over and over probably for what I think are three main reasons. In the version of the story in the Gospel of John, There's this young boy who has the five loaves and two fish. And so we want kids to know that they're important and that they can be used by God. A second thing is that it's miraculous. And who doesn't love a good miracle story? Like, how did Jesus do that? And number three, Jesus is meeting the most basic needs of people. And that is something that he calls us to do all over scripture. Now, whenever we go on a, like the Center for Student Missions type trips, like the Nashville group did, um, like in New York and Chicago and Washington, D.C., we're especially challenged to do some type of excursion where we are taken out of our comfort zone and have to go out onto the streets and talk to people in the city. In, in New York, some groups were given... Uh, $10, and they had to use that $10. They had to find somebody who had a need, and they had to meet that need with the $10 that they had. And in Chicago, and for some of us in New York, we were sent out into smaller groups with $2 per person, and with that, we were supposed to somehow find a way to feed ourselves and hopefully someone else as well. And in D.C., we had to do that $2 thing as well, but 
we had to ask strangers, where, where would I sleep if I'm homeless? Where would I get medical help? Um, where would I eat if I were homeless? And now in Nashville, we were sent out into two different challenges. One was called Beat the Heat, as some of the students mentioned, and another was called Urban Exposure. Now, on Thursday morning for my group on the high school trip, we were sent out into four different groups. There was one leader per group and two to three students with them for the urban exposure. So before we left, we had to make a lunch for ourselves, and we had to make one extra lunch that we would give away to a homeless person and ask if we could eat with them to get to know them. Now, when Kyle's group set out, um, someone early on asked them, hey, can I have a lunch? And they, of course, you're not going to turn somebody down when you've got lunches right there, right? But we were told, ah, save the lunches for later, because who wants to eat at 10 a.m., right? You want to have your lunch closer to noon. So they gave away their lunch, and they're like, great, what are we going to do later when we're supposed to feed some people? Um, but in the meantime, uh, they did some of the other tasks that they had to do. Um, they were supposed to talk to uh, somebody like a police officer, a musician, a tourist, and also go to the, the public library and learn about homelessness in Nashville. So after accomplishing these other tasks, they decided to get this foot-long sub from Subway because they wanted to still be able to eat with someone else and get to know them. So they got that, and they, it didn't take long for them to find some hungry people. So they sat down with this couple and gave them the foot-long sub, and they started talking and getting to know them, and Kenzie and Kaylee started eating their lunch. And uh, people around kind of caught on, oh, these are people who are giving away free food. So they come over, and they come up, and they say, hey, can I have a lunch? And so Kyle, good guy he is, sacrificed his own lunch and gave it to somebody else and gave him his water as well. And so they keep talking and they keep talking. And then somebody else comes up and they say, hey, can I have a lunch? And Kyle's like, ah, I don't think I have any left. But he opens up his backpack and he's like, oh. So he hands them this lunch and he hands them an extra water bottle. And they keep talking and keep talking. And then all of a sudden, Kenzie goes, Kyle, where did you get that other lunch? And he just shrugs his shoulders and says, I don't know. They had no idea where this extra lunch and water came from. and It was nothing short of miraculous. Kyle told this story in our group debriefing time later in the day, and he closed with this phrase, no one was left hungry. And when he told the story, it brought tears to my eyes. And it reminded me of today's scripture of feeding the 5,000, in which it says they all ate and were satisfied. Now, I know that this group didn't see God miraculously feed 5,000 people, but they saw God feed one person miraculously, and that is just amazing <laughs> to me. But God doesn't need to use miracles to feed people, does he, to meet their basic needs. He can use us. We praise God for miracles, but we also praise God for students who are Christ followers who want to be like Jesus and meet people's basic needs by feeding them. And we see Jesus meets basic needs throughout all of Scripture. He feeds people over and over. He heals people over and over. He forgives sins, and he prays for people. And there's a famous passage in Matthew 25 that talks about the sheep and the goats. And, and basically, the passage summarizes with Jesus saying that those who will inherit eternal life are those who are meeting the basic needs of others. Because he says, those who gave me something to drink when he was thirsty, those who fed him when he was hungry, those who invited him in when he was a stranger, those who clothed him when he needed clothes, or visited him when he was sick or in prison, those are the people who will inherit eternal life. So the Gospels shout this. They, it's hard to miss that that's what we're called to do. Jesus in, is in the business of meeting people's basic needs, and he calls us to do the same. 
in college and seminary, and probably for many of you even in high school, uh, a chart keeps showing up that kind of explains people's basic needs. Uh, I believe it's called Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So at the bottom in this re red section is people's physiological needs, like breathing, food, water, shelter, clothing, and sleep. Those are the most basic things that each person needs, each human being needs. And then as you go up the chart, you see things that, that aren't like as necessary as, they're not the foundation, but they are still needs that people have. And so when I looked at this chart, I thought this covers pretty much everything that our two youth groups did on mission trip. On our high school mission trip, we were used by God to meet people's basic needs at, um, at the place called NICE. And this here is uh, where, if you can change to the next slide of the group, there we go. Um, this is at NICE, where we mentored kids. Uh, these are children whose parents are either immigrants or refugees. And so English is a big issue for them. So they worked a lot on reading and vocabulary, but we worked on math as well, just to help kids to get ahead in the summer so they're not falling behind so that they have a chance. Because you've got to think long-term with these people, with kids. Even when we did tutoring with Blacktop, long-term is, is that they, they can keep up in school when they're young. Then they are more likely to succeed and get a job and contribute positively to society. So this is really important. Um, at Nashville Cares, Mason mentioned that uh, there's a guy who maybe had HIV or AIDS, and he needed some help with his house. Basically, he felt he, he wasn't able to keep up. And so they said they cleaned up so much that they, they didn't even realize till an hour in that there was a ladder in the front yard or backyard or something like that because there were so many weeds that were growing over it. Like, this guy was falling so behind, and our group just really killed it, uh, cleaning up that property. At the YMCA, they called it YCAP. Um, Mason also mentioned that the, the students were taken into a room and they gave them interview skills for a job. I, I thought that was the coolest thing. I, I wish that I would have had that when I was younger, right? But these kids are getting like a little, some tips on what to do and to what not to do when you're interviewing for a job. It was so cool. And then at Second Harvest, we packed food, the most basic of needs, food, uh, to send to soup kitchens to, to all around Nashville. And then on our middle school mission trip, we packed uh, lunches for Kids Food Basket. Now this is, uh, this is similar to hand-to-hand, -to -hand except for Kids Food Basket gives meals pretty much every day to kids. Like during the school year in Holland, there's 500 kids a day who receive a meal when they go home from school. And then during the summer, there's different programs that are going on, like Blacktop Rec, for instance, and they do 150 meals during the summer for kids. So as kids were getting picked up or as we were dropping them off on the bus, we were handing them a bag lunch so that they had something to eat in the evening. Also at Blacktop Rec, we, we got to tutor kids who need extra help, um, as I mentioned, just to think long term and, and to help them uh, have a good education to keep up with the rest of the kids in the world to be able to succeed. And also, we just we played with kids at Blacktop Rec. Now, when you think of that, you're not like, well, how is that meeting a basic need? Um, on the surface, it doesn't feel like that. But during our de debriefing time, one of our leaders, Emily, she pointed out something, and it really clicked with me because I already knew where I was headed with this message today. And she, said, she was just sharing, and she's like, you know, these kids just want their basic needs met. And I was like, yeah. Go, Emily. And she said they, they just need to be loved unconditionally and to be supported because they don't find that at home. And to have consistency in their life. These leaders who are there every week uh, for these kids are consistent with them. And they need to have loyalty. And you can see that there's some of them that are super tight with some of their friends. I saw two kids. Um, one of them, they, they get angry pretty quick at Blacktop. They're, there's a lot of anger issues going on. And um, there's this one uh, kid, Poppy is what his nickname was, right? And he just was all riled up. And one of his buddies came up and he just put his hand on his shoulders and he leaned in and put his forehead against uh, his forehead. And, and he was just like, man, 
stay calm, man. Just stay calm. It's cool. It's cool. And they need loyalty like that. And they have their friends, but they need adults, too, who are loyal to them. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite those who are going to help hand out water bottles. So stand up and grab them. We're going to hand each of you a little water bottle. And I don't want you to drink it, even if you're super thirsty right now. I want you to hold on to it for the moment, okay? So just spread out and let's get everybody a water bottle. So as they're handing those out, I wanted to share another story uh, from our Nashville trip. When, on Friday afternoon, we were sent out uh, to beat the heat by handing out water bottles to people and trying to have a conversation with them and to pray with them. And so our group headed straight to the public library because that's where many of the homeless people hang out. See, earlier in the week, we learned that when you're wandering the streets and you have no money, the library is your friend because it's a public place. You don't need to buy anything to use the restroom, like many of the cases. Uh, restaurants sometimes even have like a combination lock on their door that you get on your receipt like, that allows you to go in the bathroom because they don't want people just wandering into their, their place and using the bathroom. Um, so it, the library also brings relief from the heat because it's air conditioned. Um, and when I was in the bathroom the day before, I saw guys in there who were shaving and who are bathing themselves in the sink. The library staff is super friendly and they're welcoming to the homeless. And what struck me in Nashville is how most of the homeless people were pretty friendly to us compared to other cities where we've interacted with homeless people. They were a close community and they, they um, were intermixing with different ages and different race. So on Friday, uh, the people that we walked up to hand out water to, they had these two dogs. So that made it easy for our students to be able to strike up some conversation, asking, you know, what's your dog's name, you know, petting the dog and kind of learning a little bit about it. Um, and it was just nice to hear, like, people's stories. As I mentioned before with, um, with Sarah, she said that this guy's story could happen to anybody the reason that he became homeless. And we got to hear these people's stories about how they became homeless and how they ended up in Nashville. And it was just good to actually um, have a story to go along with the face. And we were able to provide for some of their basic needs. We gave them water, and we gave them this dignified, respectful, human conversation, and then we prayed for them. Now, the prayer was... It was just this beautiful moment for me. We closed our time by asking them if we could pray for them, and the woman was ecstatic. She was so excited, and she wanted to stand in a circle and pray, uh, but she could barely stand. So we helped her up, and she said, I'll never turn down prayer. And so there we were, standing in the middle of Nashville, in a circle, holding hands with this biracial couple, a youth pastor, and three students, and in that moment, I took this out-of-body mental picture as if there was a drone above our heads taking a snapshot, and I just thought, God must be smiling down on us right now. It was such a cool moment of us meeting people's basic needs. Now, with meeting people's basic needs, it doesn't matter if they're thankful or appreciative. Sometimes they're just not. But what matters is that we need to be like Jesus and meet the needs of people around us. It's not about getting more people to attend our church, though we want that. We want people to attend our church. We hope and pray for people to have eternal life, and we need to verbally evangelize to people. But Jesus gives this example of first, meeting people's basic needs. So this water bottle that you have, this is to help you to remember this week to meet people's basic needs. So I don't want you to drink it. I want you to take it home or put it in your car to see it and to think about how Jesus calls us to meet people's basic needs. This is how we can share the love of Christ.
So how do we meet people's basic needs this week? When you notice someone needs prayer, stop. Pray out loud in the moment. When you realize that someone needs to talk, listen in the moment. When someone is hungry, feed them. When someone is hurting, go visit them. There are so many ways that you can get involved here at Zion to serve others. And there are so many organizations in West Michigan that could use another volunteer. You might think, ah, one more volunteer is going to make a big difference. It doesn't matter if it's making a big difference. Jesus is calling us to serve, no matter what the size of the difference is. God wants to use you to meet the needs of others. So the next time you notice that someone is thirsty, thirsty, give them something to drink. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for your word that continues to speak into our lives today. Over and over in scripture, we see Jesus meeting the needs of others and calling us to do the same. So put that desire in us to meet the needs of others. When we sense the Spirit's prompting to help someone else out, may we not ignore you, but instead respond in obedience. Open our eyes to the needs of others. Use these little water bottles to remind us of our call to serve and to meet the needs of others. And when we meet the needs of others, may it lead to trust and open doors to share our faith in Christ Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.